Welcome to the Champs App Podcast, where we help players and parents demystify the world of minor hockey development and recruiting for both girls and boys. On today's episode, I chat with Carla Pentamone from Women's College Hockey Recruiting. We discuss in great detail the women's college recruiting process, and Carla provides some very practical tips, techniques, and advice on how to communicate with coaches. This was a highly informative episode, and I hope you were able to use some of the tools Carla shares. Before we start the podcast, I wanted to let you know about the app in Champs App. Champs App lets you create a free, beautiful, online hockey resume to share with coaches, teams, and players. Your profile includes all the information coaches want to know to help decide if you are a player they want to keep on their recruiting radar. What makes Champs App unique is that you can then connect directly with college prep or team coaches, and they can then follow your updates. So when you add a new highlight video or a game to your schedule, they will automatically get notified of these changes to your profile. It's a really easy way to keep all your connections up to date. Just go to www.champs.app and click the sign up button to start your profile. And check out the links in the show notes to see a list of some of the college coaches already using Champs App that you can connect with. Stay tuned after the episode for more details on how easy it is to create your Champs App hockey resume. I'm very excited to have on the podcast, Carla Pentamone, who is the founder of Women's College Hockey Recruiting. Hailing from Chicago, Illinois, Carla played her youth hockey with the various AAA programs in the Chicagoland area, Team Illinois, Mission, and Chicago Young Americans. She then started her college career at Sacred Heart University, but then transferred to Wisconsin and won two national championships there in 2010 and 2011. After college, she went on to coach at the youth, junior, and college level before starting women's college hockey recruiting, which helps both girls and boys navigate the, com- navigate the complex world of college and junior recruiting. Welcome to the podcast, Carla. Ray, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited. Uh, so delighted to have you here. As uh, I kind of mentioned right before we hit record, it's been uh, several months that I've been hoping to get you on the podcast. And usually I start asking our guests about their hockey history. But more importantly, today, I want to ask you uh, to begin by asking how you are feeling because you're literally days from having your first child. <laughs> well, I'm really excited. Sorry, it took me a little bit to get on here. Um, with the baby coming, it's it's been a lot of placing my 23s and 24s. Um, but just so excited um, for little Blake Joseph to be headed our way. My husband and I are really excited. Uh, my husband was a Notre Dame guy, and obviously I'm a Badger, so we're fighting for what onesie he's going to wear at the hospital. But um, I've been doing great. Um, I'm excited to be this year coaching Loyola Academy, their girls team. So they've been really gracious to kind of um, just bear with me and, and see when I'm going to be delivering and then just jump right into the season. So we have our kickoff meeting tonight. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Okay, great timing. And, and obviously, I'm really hoping this, uh, this podcast episode gets released before you have the baby, so it'll still be timely. <laughs> um, but why don't we start you off with uh, the, the, you know, you telling us a little bit about your hockey history and specifically how someone like you was able to play at Wisconsin and D1 hockey um, after only starting playing hockey at the age of 13. So I started uh, as a figure skater. Um, I watched my brother and my father play and Finally, after watching a lot of them playing at the rink, uh, I was able to ask my dad to to trade in my hockey or my figure skates for some hockey skates. Um, And I I just always loved the team mentality. I loved watching uh, my brother and his teammates just get so close um, and and be able to wear the same jersey. And it was just a lot different than figure skating. So um, I think the figure skating definitely helped uh, in my in my hockey endeavors. But so uh, I played for the Skokie Flyers. Then back then there was only enough room for like two teams. So we did not have um, the parity that we have now with with women's hockey and the growth. So um, I did play for uh, Team Illinois and then the mission back when it was Connie's Pizza uh, and then CYA, it's the Chicago Young Americans, now the Windy City Storm. So lots of changes since then. Um, I remember just sitting with my dad in the living room and emailing tons of coaches and not really knowing what I was doing, but it was always my dream to play college hockey. Um, and so um, very, very late, I got a look by Sacred Heart University. Um, and Coach hey Carla, Tom- before we get to, before we get to, before mm-hmm. we get to Sacred Heart University. So yes. starting to play hockey at 13 is, is a non-trivial task. So I'm <laughs> just curious, obviously you became pretty good pretty quickly, but what was the <laughs> hardest part 
in your development of learning to actually play hockey? Obviously, probably not the skating since you were a figure skater. I would say the stick handling for sure. And I had a great coach by the name of Mike Bromberg. And he knew that year we were not going to be very good. We were competing against Megan Bozak, Kendall Coyne, um, some of the best of the best uh, on the opposing team. So that whole year was a developmental year at U16. And we just spent the entire year working on our stick handling and development. And I'm forever grateful for him for, for doing that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And so, but, and if I understand correctly, you were pretty good that you started getting recognized by USA hockey relatively quickly as well. So that helped lead to, to some college opportunities. Uh, maybe just talk about that development, you know, still before you, you officially committed to any, any school. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I think one thing that I will tell all the girls watching this is when you are at USA hockey evaluations in your district, don't be afraid to pull out different moves. So I remember the exact moment I got scouted by USA Hockey um, for back then, the, the 1718s uh, was just, I did a move where I pulled the puck through my legs and I beat the defenseman. I was scared as heck to be able to do it, but I remember that one move. And then I did my, my go-to move, just took the puck wide on the right side, did a little Gretzky top shelf. So um, it was, um, you know, I think, for me, confidence was key. Um, I was always a little bit nervous because I had started late. So I would have conversations with my family about confidence all the time and going into that, skating with the puck a little longer than I than I could. And um, so, yeah, so I was able to make the 17-18 uh, national camp back then. It was in Lake Placid. So we got the opportunity to uh, play at the Olympic Training Center and, and live there for the week, which was phenomenal and so much fun and uh, lots of great peers that I was lucky enough to to be around for for those uh, those weeks. Awesome, awesome. And so obviously that helped play a role in helping you get recruited. So let's talk about you now, like reaching out to coaches and figuring out uh, where 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 to play in college. Yeah. So you know back then um, there were you know, not a, not a whole lot of information online or, or available, but um, I did, I was able to just kind of compile a list of coaches and their email addresses. And I would just spend my, any, any free time I had when I wasn't double rostering high school and AAA, reaching out to coaches proactively um, and being really, really proactive. I was certainly not one of those kids that was getting the calls myself. And um, I've always kind of had the mentality of, of the squeaky wheel being the, you know, getting the grease and, um, you know, kind of coming from uh, an Italian family uh, who, came, you know, uh, kind of came here um, right off the boat. We've always been kind of grinders and just putting our name out there. So I think that's the mentality I've always had is just, um, you know, if there's a will, there's a way. So that's kind of what I did. I, I reached out to a whole bunch of coaches and Sacred Heart was, uh, was the one who took my number, which was really exciting. And about April um, uh, of 07, I remember I got a call from, from Coach Nicole. Gotcha. Okay. And so, um, so was that the only opportunity that you had? And was it like an easy decision then to, to go there? It really was. It was the only opportunity I had back then. They were Division One independent, um, and so I, uh, I, I took them up on it. I was really nervous to move away from my family, um, but you know, for me back then, it was that was kind of my dream. Is I just wanted to play Division One college hockey, um, and that's kind of what I was a little bit laser focused on. Which is, you know, in hindsight, kind of what I what I tell my girls is you got to make sure that it's the right fit overall. Um, and I was so blessed to be able to play at Sacred Heart and get a lot of minutes and a lot of time. Um, but coming from from a big family and being from the Midwest, um, it uh, it wasn't necessarily exactly I think where I should have been. So that's kind of led to my transition. Gotcha. Yeah. And so you had a pretty good first year, right? You got 14 points in 24 games, and that's pretty good for a freshman playing uh, D1 hockey. Um, so what were the factors in your decision to, to make a change? And I know it was a very positive experience. You still have a very good relationship um, with the folks at Sacred Heart University. But maybe just describe what the factors were in um, deciding that, hey, maybe you want to look at other opportunities. And how did that opportunity arise? 
Sure. So, you know, you're, you're right on the money. I am very, very forever grateful for coach Tom O'Malley. Um, he's like a, he's like a wonderful uncle to me and we still get Christmas cards and I'm really excited to be headed there in January, um, for the inaugural opening of the, the new rink. Um, so I love my time there. And if it wasn't for coach Tom, I, I really don't think I would have been at Wisconsin with, with him giving me such a great recommendation. Um, but you know, for me, I think a location, and size were a large factor of it. Um, I had always dreamed of, of you know, going and, and being at the University of Wisconsin, both as a student, um, but I never in my wildest dreams thought it could be an opportunity to, to be a rostered player on the team. Um, but I did see Coach Mark Johnson speak at uh, in Lake Placid, and it was just so inspiring. Um, I felt like I had the chills when he was speaking and um, just the um, pillars that that he um, brought to the team of passion, commitment, and integrity. And uh, so at that point in time, um, I had Dan Cook, who's still um, coaching there. And so um, I had I had him as a coach for national camp. And so I had reached out to him um, after kind of letting coaches know that I was thinking about potentially, you know, making a, a, a change and he said, you know, you can try, but we have a very large roster, including, you know, Hillary Knight and Megan Duggan and, and come try, but we're not sure if there's going to be room for you. So um, it was a lot of discussions with my family that summer, seeing if it was going to be the right move to um, kind of up and, and potentially leave playing collegiate hockey for, you know, an opportunity to um, or, or not an opportunity. So I, I decided to make that jump. And um, after about a month, it was about a month in the tryout process. And I was very fortunate to have some wonderful peers and leadership at Wisconsin, um, Erica Lawler and Megan Duggan, who kind of embraced me with open arms. And I think that um, you know, kind of what I brought to the team from a from a personality standpoint, surely not my skills, um, led me to uh, kind of having an opportunity uh, for for Coach Mark Johnson to give me a tap on the head and say, "You you got a you have a roster spot after about a month um, trying out for the team." So it was really really exciting. Okay, so now I got a whole bunch of questions related to this. <laughs> so. Um, first of all, tryouts. That's unique. Uh, you're the first person that I've ever heard actually having to try out for, for a team. Is this because you were trying to walk on? Is that, is that what it was? And there was a period of doing that. And that, that, that's my first question. The second is, what year was this? Because I know you ended up redshirting. So can you explain kind of the timeline a little bit as it relates to the tryouts and, and you actually joining the team? Sure. So I was um, in 2000. Uh, 7, 2008 was my freshman season at Sacred Heart. And then 2008, 2009 was when I, uh, I guess you could say, tried out for the team. Um, it was not a preferred walk-on spot. It was a true walk-on spot. So uh, I think they just wanted to make sure to evaluate me and make sure that I had the proper skills to kind of uh, be able to swing it and keep up at practice. And um, so, you know, I ate my Wheaties and, and was able to get down to business for that month. Gotcha. Okay. So that, so um, it was during that 2008, 2009 year that you were practiced with the team basically. And then you were able to stick around based on your performance during the trial period. And then, um, so uh, one question is, is what did you do during that red shirt year? Was it just all academics or was it, you, you were, were you able to practice with the team the whole year and train with them? So I actually was able to practice and uh, practice and play play some games with the team. I, I was able to to suit up a little bit. So technically, it wasn't like a a true red shirt year because I was able to kind of travel with the team and have some experiences with them. Um, so I never really used a red shirt season because I didn't play out my fifth year. Gotcha. Okay. So then uh, we need to get your stats updated on elite prospects for that red shirt year there because, uh, <laughs> um, and, and okay. And then my, my, my next question is, is uh, the following two years, you, you won national championships, but in the 2010 year, it was an Olympic year. And usually the Badgers have several players go off to the Olympics um, and they, they are centralized. Um, and did that help you with uh, get you more playing time uh, in your, in your first full year playing with the team? Yeah, absolutely. So that year I transferred there, they won a national championship. So I'm not going to say it had any, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> not, but I did, I did bring my rings for, to show everybody. So we wow. got, we got, we got our rings here. Um, and so that, that first year, you know, better did a phenomenal job for us in net. 
Um, and it was just so, so very exciting. So we were um, in Boston and just one of the, the most memorable times of my life was able to go to Fenway Park um, with, with some of the Olympic greats. Um, and then that next year, um, Coach Mark Johnson and, and um, uh, quite a few of our players headed to go play in the Olympics. And we had Tracy DeKaiser uh, fill in as our coach and she did a wonderful job. Um, so yes, I was able to uh, get some games in and, and uh, suit up for quite a few games. I got some, some time. I almost scored a goal. Uh, I did not score, but the really cool thing that I will always remember about um, the, the year that um, the Olympic year in 2010 was it was the first ever women's outdoor classic at Camp Randall Stadium. So it was a, actually for the girls, it was not so cold, but I remember my family just bundling up and all the families bundling up. Um, and it was a, it was a very, very chilly day, uh, went outside and we played the Beavers, um, Bemidji State, and uh, it was just such a cool event and kind of a momentous event in women's hockey. Um, and then all the girls came back in 2011. Um, we had a great, great roster um, and that we, we got Alex Rigsby and Dex on at that point. Um, and we won it again in 2011, uh, which was absolutely phenomenal. So i uh, got some more time on the bench at that point. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, and hopefully something similar happens this year with the Wisconsin Badgers, with them getting a whole bunch of uh, the players back from the Olympic team or the centralized players as well. Um, so uh, so I, I know clearly you, you do have no regrets about going to Wisconsin, but from purely a hockey playing time perspective, is there any part of you that says, well, if I stuck around at Sacred heart maybe I would have gotten a lot more games in you know I think it's different for everyone and that's really kind of what I harp with my players is what experience they want and for me I really wanted to be part of something bigger than myself um for me it wasn't it wasn't as much about the playing time I got as as being a, a role uh or playing a role in the locker room I remember one time specifically um we were down on the WCHA finals and uh I I just saw all the hanging heads in the locker room uh, going into that third period. And it was kind of make or break for us. It was going to help us um, in a lot of ways with, with seating. And so I remember Coach Johnson had a very, very short talk. And I took a big gulp. And I, as soon as he shut the door after his speech, I, I kind of got up and I got those girls going. I started screaming my head off and I said, we're all in here for a reason. We deserve to be in here. And I, I don't know exactly what I said, but uh, anyhow, we went out uh, and we went into an overtime period and have one had one of the most exciting games. And I think um, a lot of it is, you know, being a player that, you know, wasn't, I guess, as skilled and just still so grateful for the opportunity to to be on that big stage um and i think the the girls who were really really skilled kind of saw that hey you know we are we're at the the top of the top here and if this if this player who never gets any playing time can just be energized and excited to be here uh i think i think i kind of helped those girls to to give them a boost up and um so for me I, it wasn't as much about playing time as it was about um, being able to share my excitement and, and you know, be a, a force for positivity and, and, and energy for, for the rest of the team. Well, now I understand how you won the team's most inspiring player Badger Award. Uh, so that, that explains it. And I, and I believe uh, you even had some articles written about you, about like the role that you play and that you're the quote, quote unquote the Rudy, um, which is uh, kind of uh, a movie that was made about a F Notre Dame football player. And uh, you're, you're small in stature too, as I understand it. And so uh, you're the one who, who was there helping everybody else get better and, and was the character player on the team. Is that correct? Yes, and I, I do try to be that very same way as a coach and as an as an advisor for my girls as well. So I I think uh, you know it's it's kind of always been my personality is just to kind of be that hype that hype woman for uh, for all my athletes. Gotcha. And so um, you know over the last couple of years, as I've learned a lot about uh, women's college hockey recruiting, I do hear a lot of advice being sent out of. Well, would you rather be a fourth or fifth line player on one of these top teams like a Wisconsin, you know, like a Clarkson, you know, uh, et cetera, or would you rather be a, you know, a significant contributor 
you know, with a lot more ice time on as a first line or second line player, on, on maybe a slightly, you know, lower rank school. Um, what advice do you have for folks who are like trying to decide, like, do I want to be a, you know, um, you know, small fish in a, in, in a big program, or do I want to be a big fish in, in a slightly smaller program? And that could also go for the D1 versus D3 decision as well. Absolutely. I think it's different for every player and being able to kind of have realistic conversations and evaluating how you feel as a youth player and in your AAA days, you know, when there's big crunch time moments and, you know, maybe you were either, you know, on the bench for that moment, how do you feel internally and really checking in with yourself? Are you excited to have, you know, the opportunity to, you know, be on the bench, you know, kind of you know, encouraging teammates, or is it is it hard for you? And there's nothing wrong with either one of those answers. I think um, for me, I I was able to do that, um, and it was it was a different experience, and I was you know maybe a little bit different uh, in, in that ability. But I always tell my players, you know, you have to really dig deep inside of you yourself, and you only get four years to do it. And I think with a lot of my athletes, I really encourage them if they are a bubble D one D three player. Uh, to ask themselves, you know, do you want to be on the bench for the next four years? Because, you know, we can certainly kind of squeak you on potentially to a division one roster, but, you know, you can go ahead and play for a, on a, uh, you know, on a big front and uh, play division three college hockey. And a lot of times, you know, some of the the division three teams uh, that are the top teams can beat some of the lower end division one teams as we've seen. So um, I think it's just real conversations that we need to have with, with our athletes um, to see where they might be and, and where they're at. And also I think the biggest thing is, you know, we always talk about the break your leg analogy is if, you know, you weren't to be, if you weren't able to play hockey, would you still want to be at that school? So I think it's kind of a two factor um, you know, questioning that I go through with my athletes to kind of figure out um, what's going to be the best place for them. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Before we get uh, really deep into the recruiting process, I just want to talk about the stuff that you've done after Wisconsin. I know you're heavily involved in uh, youth and amateur hockey and, and college hockey in the Chicago area. Um, and you talked a little bit about now helping up the women's program. But what I really um, was very uh, delighted to see is the efforts that you do with the blind hockey of the uh, team with, related to the Chicago Blackhawks. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I saw a YouTube video. Um, this goes back about, you know, eight years ago um, for the Chicago Blackhawks blind hockey. And I just thought it was so very interesting. Um, in my time at Wisconsin, I did a lot of work with the Rolling Flames wheelchair hockey organization, which is, um, it's not sled hockey. It's basically for athletes who um, are not able to get out of their wheelchairs. And it's really neat. The UW athletic department uh, put together um, the, um, uh, these these little pushers so that would push the puck forward and I really enjoyed my time um, as a pusher and I wanted to get involved um, in helping athletes uh, be able to play hockey um, with different abilities you know I always say we all have something that we struggle with and you know none of us are uh, none of us have it easy and so some at some athletes you know have different levels of abilities and so uh, I saw the I saw blind hockey and I saw visually impaired hockey um, in the Chicagoland area just kind of getting up and started. So uh, I reached out uh, uh, to Mike Savak and he's like, yeah, you know, come out. Um, and then ever since then, I, I really got immersed and, and dive, dove pretty deeply into it, um, would go every single year to the USA Hockey Disabled Sec uh, Disabled Festival. Now there's actually um, there its own week for blind hockey, which is really cool. We see that just the growth of, um, of visually impaired hockey and, and obviously the Paralympic team as well. Um, so I'm super, I've been super blessed to be able to um, coach and, and kind of be a lead in getting um, the the programming kind of up and running in the structure. Um, this will be the first year with the baby coming that I am, um, I'm not going to be um, kind of fully uh, participating, which I'm uh, a little, you know, bummed out about, but I know uh, once little Blake gets older, I'm going to get back into it. So. And, and for folks who don't understand how blind hockey works, what, you know, what's the key to helping them actually play um, given that their, their visual impairedness? 
So, you know, I think the biggest thing is just making sure that, you know, whenever you're explaining a drill, uh, that you have to think about, you know, not being able to see that drill. So really giving a lot of, of cues verbally of, of where they're going to be going. Um, so the puck is about, you know, yay big. It, it, uh, it's either made of tin or there's ones that have kind of a continuous dry rating noisemaker inside of it. Um, but a lot of the players prefer that tin puck because it makes a little bit of a bigger noise. So, um, you know, I'd say that, you know, we a lot of times we'll do stride count as we're going down the ice. They'll count the amount of strides from kind of end to end and then sideboard to sideboard. Um, you know, the I'd say that positionally, so the goaltenders typically are completely blind and they're kind of escorted to their nets. Um, and then our defense are a little bit um, more sighted, but still can't, you know, have different various levels of vision. And our forwards um, are can are probably our most highly sighted players, uh, but they, you know, obviously are still legally blind. So um, it's, you know, there are, there is a little bit of vision in there. So, um, but there's different rules, offside rules. Player can't just skate the puck end to end. They have to make one pass once they get into the zone, which is queued up by the ref with a different noise. So lots of really neat nuances and rules and, um, Man, if you get a chance to watch a visually impaired hockey game from start to finish, it's it's absolutely incredible. And and just so many things that people just take for granted when they just play, you know, uh, regular sighted hockey. That that the the game is just uh, you know a completely different experience if uh, if you're visually impaired. So it's uh, thank you for explaining that. That's 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 phenomenal to to hear how they kind of make it all work, uh, especially with the different levels of sightedness. So thank you for sharing that. Cool. All right, let's move over into the, the into the recruiting process. Um, you know, I just came back from Pittsburgh, where there were dozens of teams from all over North America. Uh, the season has begun. Recruiting has begun. And, um, you know, I spoke to several coaches while I was there. Um, and one thing which, which, really stood out to me is I, cause I've seen many of these coaches at many different places during the spring and the summer events was how many days a year that they are out there recruiting, which leads me to believe there's a lot of inefficiency in the recruiting process. So what, what are the things that contribute to like a good recruiting process, just from a coach's perspective in terms of like why they're going out all the time and looking for players and having to spend so many, so many hours in rinks? Yeah. So I think, you know, this weekend was a big testament to, you know, we saw a lot of the assistant coaches maybe at Naha and, you know, the head coaches, um, you know, at, at the Kathy Pippi event and, you know, vice versa, um, kind of splitting time. We also had the NGHL showcase. Um, so there was a lot going on this weekend. And I think for coaches, um, organizationally, that's something that, you know, at WCHR, we kind of pride ourselves on with our athletes is just making sure that they get schedules in their hands, kind of, you know, you know, beforehand and, and kind of knowing which play coaches are where. But um, I definitely think, you know, with the, you know, the the lower number of of schools uh, that we have, you know, the, the 42 Division ones and, and 72 Division threes, I'm pretty sure I got those numbers right. Um, yeah. It's just, it, it's not easy for every coach to be everywhere, but there's so much great talent and the talent pool is, has really grown. You know, we have Stony Creek coming up as well um, in Ontario. And it's just, I think, um, you know, being able to have the budget to recruit, especially, you know, obviously we, we have great budgets for some of the higher end programs, but, you know, for division three, um, you know, they're really scrapping to be there and, and just, it's, I think it's amazing that they're taking so much of their time to, to, you know, be out there and away from their families. So, um, it's, it, it's just growing. And I think everybody, everybody that has been involved with, with the sport now, um, has has really assisted in in that growth process. Yeah, and they're out there, and you know, um, over the summer I spoke to several D one coaches, and I was asking them, okay, so you go one of these events, you know, what are you looking for? What do you get out of it? And basically, what they're telling me is, by the end of this event, for all the the you know, especially for showcases, by the end of it, I've, I will have rated and ranked just about every player at every position by, by birth year. Um, you know, there's some who are just there just having fun, but the ones who are showing up with the iPads or the, the big pieces of paper, stacks of paper with the colored, uh, colored markers that they're using, you know, they're, they're going through every single player and they're, they're getting them ranked. And it's, and it's pretty hard to do that. So how do you stand out in this? And, and I know you have something called your six pillars of recruiting. Why don't you just talk about like how you help your, your uh, clients, you know, stick out in, in this world of, you know, literally 
couple of thousand players that they're looking at every year to to make the 250 D1, roughly speaking, players and triple that maybe for uh, D2 or double that for D, uh, sorry, D3. So, um, you know, what, what, what advice are you giving? Uh, what, what are your six pillars of recruiting to help players stand out? So, you know, I think even back in my day, uh, if you were good enough, they would try to come and find you. Um, but now it's just with the growth of the game and, you know, the geographic diversity um, of amazing teams in places like California and Arizona and, you know, remote parts of Canada, we see the need to, you know, really um, just kind of be an advocate for yourself. And, uh, you know, with women's college hockey recruiting, that's what I um, instill in my players is that, you know, you can't sit back and wait for a call. So um, part of, I think, what, what we do from an organizational standpoint is just make sure that the coaches are audited consistently. And we see, you know, hundreds of coach changes a year, um, you know, both up and down from D1. We, D, we see, you know, assistant coaches, you know, at D3 or at uh, D1 programs move up to head at D3 and, and so on and so forth. So um, I think, you know, what girls can really do to help themselves is when there is a new coach, introduce yourself to that new coach in, in that new capacities. But um, when we talk about the six pillars of recruiting, Coach Carla's six pillars of recruiting, they are calling coaches, texting coaches, emailing coaches, letters of recommendation, the utilization of Twitter and Instagram. And then we also talk about exposure opportunities. I think I added texting in there as well as kind of a new, new, newfangled one. But uh, so calls, emails, recruiting questionnaires, letters of recommendation, Twitter, and then exposure opportunities. So seven actually now that we've been doing a lot of texting. So I'll talk about each one of those a little bit individually. But, um, you know, Calling coaches, I think, is maybe the most controversial. Um, sometimes, I think, with WCHR, we have had, um, we want to make sure that we respect coaches' communication preferences. But I think a lot of our athletes that have been placed at the Division One level have been because of that direct communication and, and contact with the coach. So um, whether that is, you know, giving a call and leaving a voicemail on their office phone and or, you know, through a personal connection that I may have or um, their coach may have with, with a college coach, um, giving the coach a call has been important. I always say to my athletes, everybody and their grandmothers is emailing coaches and trying to get through to a coach on a weekend like this or prior to a weekend like the Labor Day weekend where, you know, coaches are getting hundreds of emails from coaches, calling in and leaving a voicemail can be very helpful or trying to get a hold of that coach. Um, so, um, you know, I have a little voicemail that I can um, share with you guys, just a, a loose structure. But, you know, we say, hey, coach, I hope you're having a great day. Just wanted to call and verbally introduce myself over the phone. My name is Carla Pentamone, and I am a 2024 grad year forward, currently playing for the Chicago Mission Tier 1 AAA team. I wanted to call as I'm very interested in, you know, Robert Morris for the outstanding academics. Um, and I would one day love to be a part of your hockey program. Uh, my coach, you know, Michelle, would love to speak with you about my recruiting and abilities as well. Thanks so much, and I hope you have a great day. So I think that's so I kind think of Logan like, Biddle will be very happy that you uh, you yes, included him absolutely, in your example. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yes. Logan's done a fantastic job, and we're so excited the program is back. So, <laughs> so I, 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 I do have a question about calling coaches. How many coaches do you call? So, because you, you, you're not calling all 42 D1 coaches, are you? Not all 42. I think it's, I think it's really targeted based on your grad year, based on where you're at, you know, academically. I always have uh, very real conversations with my athletes and we do a lot of evaluation. Um, part of, you know, what I'd like to kind of highlight a little bit is COVID and the log jam and where things are at as well, um, or where I see things to be at. But making sure that we're targeting the correct coaches based on your skills and abilities, what also kind of reflecting back on our conversation of, of what you're looking for. You know, do you want to be a big fish in a little pond and, you know, uh, or maybe the opposite, being a small fish and just kind of a, a cog in the wheel um, on a team, you know, and, and maybe that's just tailoring that voicemail a little bit to saying that, you know, you're willing to be a walk on or you're willing to do whatever it takes to be a rostered member of the team and kind of crafting, um, you know, that message to the coach. So um, it doesn't always have to be the same message. Uh, it could be a little bit different depending on who you're calling, 
potentially now we talk about post-grad years or, or doing, you know, an extra year of eligibility or, or being open to that. Um, I think that, you know, really crafting your message to each and every individual coach is very, very important. Um, it could be that you reach out to all of the coaches and have different, different things that you're saying to each one of the coaches. So, um, so yeah, I'd say, I'd say you, you can, if you, if you'd like, depending on, on what, uh, you know, what you're looking for. Gotcha. Gotcha. And is anything different for goalies versus skaters? Because I got goalie parents pinging me all the time. I'd say absolutely. And, you know, we have a, a couple of great goalie advisors on staff that, that help us. Um, but I'd say for goalies, especially now more than ever with COVID and the log jam, being open to, um, you know, potentially being a, a red shirt or being a goalie who doesn't get a lot of ice time for their first year or two. Uh, I think the more you can be realistic and, and open to uh, the possibility of being a practice school tender um, or potentially, you know, getting playing time later on, um, you know, the, the more open that you are, the better off that you're going to be to open doors and at least ask the question and see where you might fit in. Um, I, I think there's that's probably the most difficult spot to to be in right now with with the extra year of eligibility. I've worked with quite a few transfer goalies who um, there's not a whole lot of spots. They were Division One goalies, but they wanted to get playing time and they decided to go to a higher end Division Three program, and and that's kind of where they ended up. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so let's let's get back on track and keep going through the list. I'll talk about following up with emails and texts. Yeah. So one thing I did just want to touch on too with the calls as well is yeah. girls, if you are calling coaches, don't just have an idea of what that coach call is going to be like in your head. You really want to listen to what the coach is saying and be reflective on what they're saying. Um, for example, you might have your three questions that you're set on asking the coach, um, but a lot of times making sure that you are just uh, listening to what they have to say. If they're talking about culture, making sure that you're really understanding what that culture is and what that question is, and um, not just kind of rapid firing questions. So craft, crafting responses back to what they're saying and understanding what they're saying and um, and also utilizing some research potentially if you do have a scheduled call with a coach or if you are able to get on a call with a coach I always say no one thing about the coach at least or one thing and one thing about the program um, as we see in this podcast Coaches like myself love to talk about their glory days. I'm just so jazzed up that Ray has asked me all these questions about Wisconsin and, and my glory days. So, you know, bring up that coach's biography, bring up that coach's information, see where they've coached before, see what they've done. Um, so you can kind of, inter, you know, introduce that into a conversation. Uh, same thing with, with, uh, answering questions for college coaches um, or asking questions for college coaches. You might say, you know, hey, coach, I saw that you guys had some fantastic games last year, you know, against Amherst. I saw that you guys split with them, um, you know, leading up into a game week versus a team like Amherst. Can you walk me through what a week in the life of a student athlete at Middlebury might look like? So, you know, not just hey, what's a day in the life of a student athlete? Really being, you know, having meaningful um, questions for, for the coaches and, and responses, I think is, is going to be important. And I think, you know, as people in, in our day and age right now, we it's not usual for athletes to be talking on the phone. There's a lot of texting and a lot of, of emailing. So I urge you to, um, you know, get on get on phone calls with family members or even, you know, talk to your parents at the di dinner table because it could be a little bit stressful. Yeah, and I, I'd like to echo that because I actually had a D1 coach email me a couple weeks weekends ago um, saying that if for the first time they had one of the parents who was doing a visit with their player say they watched one of the Champs app podcasts. He wanted to let me know because they were asking really smart questions about the program after, you know, they did the research uh, about the school and about the coach. So, um, yeah, the more you do the research, the more the coaches respect it and really appreciate uh, them knowing, you know, you knew what you were coming to when you visited the campus. So. Yeah, I think it's it's incredible the opportunity that you give Ray to kind of get to know the coach coaches more on a personal level, uh, seeing them in the flesh and and hearing them ask and answer questions. It's phenomenal. All right, so uh, let's get back to emails and texts and uh, maybe yep. even social media. 
So, uh, so the emails, you know, I'd say having introductory emails, I'd say making sure that it's short, sweet, and to the point, you know, obviously you want to make sure that you are showcasing interest specifically in that school. Um, but also having, I'd say, uh, very concrete information. I like my athletes to have a mini Tiny, tiny bio section with maybe five bullet points, like, you know, your elevator speech, who are you in a nutshell, maybe two bullet points about um, your academics, two bullet points, athletics, that could be a dual sport athlete. Um, you know, that could be if you potentially have, um, you know, have made it to a next level, uh, whether it's through, you know, the NGB, USA Hockey, um, you know, if you guys made it to regionals or nationals. And then I also like to give a little flair of who you are as a person, you know, maybe uh, you hold a job or maybe, you know, you volunteer in the community. So um, who you are, I'd say five bullet points is really good to give coaches. Um, and then obviously diving into your fall season schedule right now is super important. Um, um, with as exact detail as possible. So, you know, date, um, who you're playing that day, and then where the rink is at. And obviously your jersey number is always really important information. Um, and then a list of references. Coaches are always going to call, you know, the, your references. And usually listing your coach as a reference is, is pretty important because uh, they're going to call them anyways. So um, I'd say making sure that, you know, you have everything right there for the coach, your contact information in that email is important, you know, especially in that introductory email. Uh, video, highlight video is crucial ladies absolutely crucial so making sure you have some video to reference uh for the coaches i'd say easiest not to add it as an attachment try to get something up there on youtube um and maybe a highlight video and then coaches also like to see full games as well so if you have a youtube channel i would have the duality of both of those things in there um Try to stay away from practice footage. You know, you want to have it in a game setting if you can. Um, and try to identify yourself as much as possible. So if you have a video editor or someone that can kind of put a little halo around you, make it easy on coaches because they have to evaluate and watch so much film. If you're re-emailing a coach, it's always great to kind of highlight those quick main points. Um, coaches have a lot of athletes to evaluate. And then, you know, bring something new up. You know, whether that's where you're going to be headed this summer, um, you know, what what your plans are um, with your summer exposure opportunities and potentially getting onto campuses is another topic. Um, but always have a call to action in an email. Don't just make it informational. Try to make it a call to action of, of what's the next step. Um, texting with coaches, I would say, you know, that's a little bit, obviously, when you're getting uh, to the point where, where it's permissible to be texting coaches. Um, most College coaches, um, even at Division Three, are sticking to that June 15th, uh, going into your junior year date is when we look to, to start that communication. And, you know, different coaches do have different communication preferences. Um, some of them are more apt to text. So ask them if they prefer texting because it could be a great way to um, kind of stay in constant contact and communication. You know, shoot them updates um, with, you know, what you're doing over the summer, even if it's a friendly you know, happy 4th of July to remind them that you're still alive and, <laughs> and, and kind of well, I think that could be a great way to communicate uh, with coaches if you've been in communication with them. Gotcha. And uh, I, I'd like to put in a little plug for Champs app because uh, if you create a Champs app profile, all the information that you were describing uh, a little bit earlier about what coaches are looking for, you can put in your profile and then you just send a link and it gets dynamically updated. All right. So let's, let's move on to exposure opportunities. Yes. So exposure opportunities are fantastic. I'm going to, you know, give a shout out to, um, you know, Kathy Pippi does a phenomenal job with her premier ice prospects. Um, and, you know, Harry Rosenhall does a great job with CHS. Seth um, over at any elite, uh, you know, there's just, there's some great one. Mike Cowan, it's a small, smaller camp, phenomenal camp um, with, uh, with the Midwest exposure ring sport. Kush does a phenomenal job. I did, I did a great job, uh, with, uh, back in the day, I had a lot of fun at ring sport. So, um, just making sure that you're looking at the list of coaches and, and who's there. And, uh, also I'd say like, you know, you don't need to do every single exposure event, but make sure you're targeting which schools are going to be there. And, and the programs that have kind of been longstanding um, or the exposure opportunities that have been longstanding, um, I think there's a lot of value in uh, those that have like a true vested interest in ice hockey and have been around for a long time. 
And how do you decide that versus going to a camp put on by one of the schools? So I say that it's really important to get to, you know, a camp that is put on by a school. You know, a Colgate, for example, has multiple schools uh, that attend their camps. So, you know, you're not just getting seen by the Colgate coaching staff, but all of them. But I think it is important, especially as you get um, a little bit older, to be able to experience campus and get more of a direct eye on on you um, by that coach specifically and, and also you know if there's an opportunity to um, you know immerse yourself into one of your top pro or one of your top schools um, and you have that camp invite I think it's a great idea as well um, you know for some of the some some camps can be I guess you could say a little bit more money makers uh, and that could be uh, so you know kind of just talking to your coach or, or talking to an advisor on what's going to be the best bang for your buck uh, with where you're at, you know, in your recruiting process and the timeline. Um, but I will say that I think it's important to do a little bit of a mix of, of both throughout your process. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Anything else that you want to talk about in terms of the, uh, the, your pillars of recruiting? Because otherwise well, I want to get emails, into using recruiting questionnaires. Recruiting questionnaires are also very important as well. Uh, so just making sure that, you know, you have the quantitative, quantitative data as well. Now the NCAA is, is looking to have uh, two numbers, one for division one and one for division three, as far as your NCAA clearinghouse numbers. So making sure that you have those numbers readily available when you are filling out recruiting questionnaires. Um, the other thing I wanted to just touch on is letters of recommendation. So um, talking to coaches right now, especially going into your fall season about expectations for, you know, potentially assistance with recruiting, obviously an advisor like myself can be very helpful. Um, but, you know, a letter coming from your current coach going out to the college program is going to mean a lot more than it's going to mean from someone like myself who maybe hasn't coached you. So uh, having conversations with your coaches of, you know, expectations of, you know, maybe getting something drafted for your coach of, you know, here's some things I'm doing outside of the classroom and, you know, a draft uh, or, you know, just kind of some bullet points so that they can send that out to the top programs of your, of your choice. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. Now we'll, we need to change this now to the seven pillars of recruiting by Carlos. <laughs> seven pillars, uh, sorry. All right, yeah, we're all good. Okay, so now let's moving move into discussing about actually having an advisor. And you know, a couple of years ago, I thought, well, if if if, if everybody did. You know, the parents did their job and the kids did their job and the coaches did their job. You don't really need an advisor. And I really changed my opinion on that for a variety of different reasons. So um, why don't we just talk about what are the different types of advising that you provide or different advisors provide? Because it's not just about recruiting, is it? Yeah, I would say, especially now in, in the era that we're living in, I think it's a lot more mentorship um, and, you know, potentially the mental side of things as well for families and, and what to expect, exactly. um, you know this is something that I do 60 to 70 hours a week is just um, audit coach lists and find out, you know, who's moving where. And we have a lot of different software that we use. We also are fortunate enough to uh, partner with elite prospects. Um, so that's been phenomenal to kind of be able to have that information um, online. We see it to be very important on the men's side of things, but um, I would say, you know, Really, it's a lot about the growth of the game The game as well. You know, on the men's side, we've seen advisors around for a long, long time. And as I was a coach on the men's side, um, you know, it's always, I got a guy or I know a guy or I, you know, and that's really not what it's about. It's more about uh, ha maintaining correct contact information, organizing yourself in a way um, to make sure that you're not just, you know, blasting out emails to everyone and having, you um, very concrete ways to reach out to coaches. Again, different coaches have different communication styles. So for the for the 72 division three schools and also the the 42 division one schools, those coaches are moving around a lot. So being sure to have the targeted, you know, means of communication of calls, emails, recruiting questionnaires, you know, letters of recommendation, Twitter, texting, when you should be doing that. And then also making sure that you're getting signed up for the correct camps at the correct the correct times. Um, you know, certainly there are, you know, if you've gone through it with a second child, um, you know, it could be become easier. But I think organizing information is one, um, one, you know, big help in, in kind of making sure that you have the, the correct contact information and someone 
you know, giving information about that, about your athlete other than yourself. Um, and then also just, you know, the, the mentorship and the mental side of it, um, you know, having someone outside of your family unit and, you know, outside of your uh, coaching staff, if you're having a bad day or bad stretch, um, or a good stretch to be able to talk about, you know, uh, what you can be doing differently, what, you know, you can be doing to stand out, whether that's, you know, being a little bit more selfish with the puck going into a tournament, um, you know, playing, uh, you know, I saw a goalie one time, she, after she got scored on, um, you know, she recreated the save within the net and was able to um, kind of show the, the scouts that, hey, you know, I got that. I got that goal out of my head and I'm moving on to new things. So small, little, I'd say um, the mental side of the game that we're able to help with as well. Um, and just having a sounding board um, above and beyond what your coaches may be able to do as well. Gotcha. And um, so given the different types of advising that you do, the one thing that I've noticed is that um, where an advisor really helps is for certain types of players. So like which types of players do you help the most, right? So you're probably not going to help Caroline Harvey, who is, you know, the, the best D in the country a couple of years ago. And, you know, she's going to Wisconsin and she plays on the Olympic team, right? She probably doesn't need your help because she's getting as much exposure and direct contact with it. But there are a lot of players who are D3, D1, kind of in that murky middle, um, or there are players who, who may or may not even be able to, to compete for a D3 spot. Um, um, yeah. you know, um, you know, where is it that, you know, an advisor can really be helpful, especially at, with your network and creating connections where they may not have known where that, you know, where to begin. Yeah. You know, we don't need, you know, a person like Lainey Potter probably doesn't need WCHR, right? So um, I think the biggest thing is, is there's players that are bubble D1, D3 players and sweet spots that we could hit. Um, so, you know, I think we are probably most helpful for athletes that are looking to potentially be on a di division one team um, uh, uh, who are looking to maybe play more of a role player position. That's not to say that I don't represent some fantastic players that, you know, got 20 calls on the 15th, um, you know, uh, division one players. But I'd say a lot of our athletes are needing just that extra push. Um, so kind of being able to know which programs are out there and what are some of the high academic selectivity schools out there, you know, outside of the next NESCACs potentially. Um, outside of the programs that everybody knows about that might be great fits and on the opposite side for for college coaches as well um, there are some really great hidden hidden gems on teams and especially in non-traditional hockey markets you know Florida Alliance or, or the Dallas Stars or um, teams in Arizona or California or even remote parts of Canada. I work with girls from all over that, you know, might not have the ability to get seen all the time or even girls. Um, I have a girl, Megan, who's playing on a boys varsity team who's going to, who now has, you know, multiple offers at division three high level programs. So there are all types of athletes um, and, you know, my list of girls, you know, my hundreds of girls that I have are, you know, from all different parts of the country. So I think geographic diversity for these coaches is really important. Um, the other thing that I just want to touch on as well that we assist with is, you know, in knowing so many people and kind of being, um, you know, I guess the, the conduit for, for change and helping. Um, we also talk about, you know, placement to, you know, athletes looking to make the jump from double A AA to triple A or to a hockey academy or a hybrid hockey academy. So um, just as boys play juniors um, and it can be a very convoluted world getting traded and, you know, um, there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, same thing with with year to year placement for our athletes. We kind of help with all right, are you looking to move up to AAA or are you looking to go to a traditional, um, you know, school, a traditional New England prep school within the NEPSAC? Or maybe, you know, it's finding a prep school that's, you know, the price point isn't as high for, um, but you're still able, able to play high level hockey or or a hockey, a hockey academy where it's kind of centered on, um, you know, your practices and, and there's a lot more understanding there with, with your academic schedule. So finding the right fit um, you know, socially, emotionally, and financially for families um, on a year-to-year -year basis, or if you're having a, a, you know, not the best, um, um, not the best season, you know, 
where are you going next year and how are you making your experience better as a player consistent consistently so um there's a lot that goes into that change in your hockey career you know um for those kids that you know might not have the ability to play on some of you know the best teams in the country are being looked at you know for the best teams in the country gotcha gotcha all right now um as we kind of Move to wind this up because uh, we, we could literally talk for about three more hours. I know that. <laughs> um, so maybe you'll just talk to me about the cost versus the benefit of an advisor. So on the boy side, you know, I, I know a couple of families that used an advisor to help their kid go to a prep school uh, for this fall. Uh, one play, you know, paid, you know, a reasonable amount and were really happy with their decision and felt that they really got the right one for their school. And then I know another one where they literally spent like many thousands of dollars and felt like the advisor really was just using Google and emails and doing the same stuff that they could have done. And at the end of the day, they're, well, it's a good school, the, the kid's going to be on the fifth line. Um, and so they're not really sure they made the right decision. So how do you kind of just, you know, look at the cost? Um, because I know there's a range of different levels that advisors, uh, services that advisors offer um, versus the benefit and really, you know, how, how do you know it's worth it? Yeah, so I think, you know, whenever you're whenever you're making a financial decision, it's important to do your research. And I have a list of clients and, you know, basically any client um, that's on my social media, my families are kind of free to, to reach out specifically to to other families. And and for me, I'm not really a big salesperson, but I I just I have most of my athletes are word of mouth or friends of friends and teammates of teammates um, who have utilized, you know, my our services or, or our help. Um, I think there are, you know, different different folks out there. And, you know, the idea of an advisor was very foreign, um, you know, prior to two years ago when we got this started. But there ha there are other advisors out there that are, that are also doing phenomenal jobs. But there's different ways that they approach things. You know, um, there's groups out there that kind of just give big presentations and general information, whereas we're a little bit more niche. We get on the phone and are grinding and calling coaches and kind of on the, the ground level. And it's different for e every family with what they're looking for. So I think um, looking at the, the cost benefit and, and kind of, you know, what services are you getting? Are you getting monthly coaching sessions? What are you doing on those coaching sessions? Um, you know, are you, are, do you have opportunities to, to meet with your advisors and to be seen by coaches and are they interacting with coaches? Um, so, I think contracts are important and knowing what you're getting within the services um, and the scope of the services is, is very, uh, very important. But I'd say the biggest thing for that, you know, drives, drives our athletes to continue to come and where we do have a wait list right now for, for our athletes, uh, WCHR is just that um, I'm very forthright with our, with our client information. And if, if somebody and if families want to talk to other families, uh, we share that information. And I think you could get a big flavor for who we are um, with the WCHR Instagram. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Last, uh, last recruiting related question is uh, what advice do you have for parents in this day and age, uh, especially in September, 2022, um, as they go into the start of the season and, and planning for, you know, a really heavy, uh, you know, September, October recruiting um, sessions and uh, events. Be organized. I'd say be organized is huge. If you can hit some schools and, and do some tours and get on some campuses while you're out in different parts of the country, that's phenomenal. Um, also, I just like to talk about COVID real quick and, and the log jam. So the extra year of eligibility for any athlete who passed through that 2020-2021 recruiting cycle um, really did, you know, cause a backup. So I think opening your mind to different types of programs and different, you know, kind of getting back to what we talked to at the start, um, you know, just making sure that, that you know, you realize that NESCACs are really backed up, you know, and, and same thing with a lot of the, the higher level programs. So looking outside at some of the, the top programs in the country from an academic standpoint, they might be Division three schools. Uh, they might be schools within the NEWHA that are up and coming at Division three. Um, you know, look outside the box and encourage your athletes to look outside the box. Um, I see so many parents who um, really it's their goal 
where it's laser focused on division one college hockey. And if you ask the kid, you know, they might want to get some more playing time and go to a great school somewhere else, or even within the ACHA. Um, you know, I think one of the other factors of my transfer from a smaller school to a larger school was really having that college hockey experience personally. So um, at the ACHA division one level, you know, you're able to go to football games, you're able to experience those large class sizes and have the big school on your resume um, and still play very, very high level hockey. Um, unfortunately, like the state of Michigan, for example, does not yet have a division one women's team, but they have a phenomenal school. Uh, despite what my husband would say about Notre Dame athletics versus Michigan athletics, <laughs> but uh, I have great relationship with with Coach Ned at, at Michigan, and they they have a very great you know ACHA team, for example, and that's kind of programs throughout the country. So looking at you know different programs or even within the service academy, um, you know. Uh, the Lieutenant Eric right now has a great team up and coming with the Air Force Academy. Um, so, so many different opportunities that you can research and look at um, kind of outside of the box. And it's just a matter of, of, you know, knowing where to start. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And if folks want to find you and, uh, and, and learn more about uh, WCHR, how can they do that, Carla? So I'm actually just going to put my phone number out there. That's really the best way to get in touch with me. So if you're interested, 773-875-0440 is probably the most, the best way to contact me directly. We're also on Instagram, Women's College Hockey Recruiting, or C Pentimone, P-E-N-T-I-M-O-N-E at womenscollegehockeyrecruiting.com for my email. But uh, I'm just so happy to have been able to talk to you, Ray. You bring so much energy and positivity. Um, and be sure to check out the Champs app. It's so cool. It's amazing. Um, I love the profiles. Uh, it's, it's a great way for athletes to get direct access. Well, thank you for the plug. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, all right, Carla, best of luck with uh, with the baby. And, um, you know, I'm sure we'll be in touch uh, going forward. We'll, we definitely need to get you back on again after uh, after the season and uh, discuss how, how things went with the with, with the baby and with uh, what's going on, you know, at the time in, in recruiting uh, sometime next year. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Ray. I really want to thank Carla for coming on the podcast. She shared some amazing insights and advice. You can find all of Carla's contact information in the show notes. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Before you go, I wanted to share more about the app in Champs app. If you've listened to this podcast before, you know I spend a lot of time talking with coaches, parents, and players about the hockey recruiting process. One of the key questions that people want to know is, how does a player get noticed by college coaches? While there are many ways to be discovered, the easiest way to get on a college's radar is to send a coach an email and provide them all the information they need to assess if you are a player worth keeping their eyes on. That's where the app part of Champs app comes in. Champs app was designed based on all the conversations and feedback we received about the recruiting process. And we built a tool to help players and coaches connect with a ton of the information they want to know. It all starts with creating a free, beautiful Champs app profile. After that, there are some pretty magical things that can happen to help make the recruiting process a little less overwhelming. Your Champs app profile includes all the basic academic, personal, and athletic information coaches want to know. Then, by including video, schedule information, and your coach's contact details, colleges can easily start their evaluation process. You just copy and paste your personalized link and send it to coaches so they can see your public player profile without even having to log in or create a Champs app account. Or you can connect directly with coaches on Champs app. More and more coaches are creating their own Champs app profiles and connecting with players themselves every day. Now coaches can have all the information they need to assess where you might fit in their recruiting plans. Even better, college coaches can track your progress throughout the winter and showcase seasons, because as you make changes to your profile, coaches will get notified to your updates. And in the future, we will be adding even more amazing features to improve your visibility to the recruiting process and hopefully increase your odds of success. If you wanna see what a player or coach profile looks like before you start your own, look in the show notes to see some examples. My kids and I have used Champs app for their recruiting process. In fact, my son was invited to a AAA tryout thanks to his Champs app profile. So go to www.champs.app and start your player or coach profile. It only takes about 15 to 20 minutes to complete most of your key information. Good luck, and please let us know how it helped with your recruiting journey.